broken life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath and our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour Good morning, everybody. How you doing? We're going to sing some hymns this morning. Just stay in your seats. Um, lyrics will be on the screens. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Songs of loudest praise. Teach me 
Ready? Good morning, 830. Oh, you're the best. You're the best. You never disappoint me. Everybody good? Yeah. It's week 13. Do you believe it? We only have 14, 15, 16. And then we sing till we meet again, and then we all come back together again, and we get so excited. Everybody have a good week? Yeah. Any first-time visitors today? Do I have any first-time visitors today? Where are you from? I can't hear you. Delaware. What part of Delaware? Oh, good. I have a son that lives in um, Middleton, Delaware. Are you anywhere near there? Welcome. Welcome, Delaware. Anyone else? Oh, we're in California. Where? Hollywood, oh. Welcome, California. I bet you're the farthest today, the farthest visitor. Anyone else? Any other first-time visitors? Let's welcome our first-time visitors. We're so glad you're with us. There is a, a contact card in the seat in front of you, if you would fill it out and just put it in the offering basket or give it in at the bookstore, I won't nag you, but I will keep you in touch with what's happening here at the Tabernacle in case you'd like to make it more than a one-time visit, okay? Anybody here for the first time this season? Any first time? Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? We're so glad you came back. We love seeing you. Well, 138 years, the sun is shining. And the last time I checked, Jesus is still on the throne, so all is well. Amen? Um, don't forget, not, not going to belittle it, but don't forget your tickets for Saturday night, September 2nd, the fundraiser for the free after-school program. Remember all those needy children? And um, I just want to tell you, my heart has been so touched. Mary Ann Cole has offered to sponsor the night. So all of your ticket proceeds are going to go to our children. So those, yes. Those 60% of those kids who are on poverty level, they're going to be okay. Because we're going to, God's going to bring it in and, and we're going to be able to take care of them. You can buy your tickets online. You can buy them in the Narthex. Don't forget the silent auction is still going on. Um, tonight, Tony and Mark are here. And that is uh, partially underwritten by the uh, Kerr's Arts Fund. Is Charlie here? Charlie Kerr, are you here? No, he's not here. Okay, well, it's partially underwritten by them, which helps us to do night services. Tony called me this week, and he said, Paula, I've got the whole night under control. I'm like, oh. Mark and I have it, and we might have a special guest with us. He said, him sing right on through. So be here at 645. I have no idea what to expect, but if you were here last year, you know it was amazing. So 645 tonight, him sing. 7 o'clock is um, Tony and Mark. Actually, they'll probably be on at 645. All right. Did you notice all this up here? going to have a good word today. Let's pray. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. I thank you, Father, for all the weeks you've given us in this 138th season, but I thank you for today. It's a special day because every day is special. It's a gift from you. And Father, I ask you to send your spirit here today. And I ask you to bring healing where there needs to be healing. 
I ask you, Lord, where our hearts need to be convicted, that we will be convicted and we will repent, that your righteous right arm will be free to bring forth what we ask you for. I ask that blind eyes are open and deaf ears hear in the places where we've been blinded by the enemy, in the places where our hearts have not been ready to hear. But today we will. I ask you, Father, for a special blessing on each and every one that is here today. The special things that are on their hearts, hear their cry today and let them go out refreshed in a better place with you, ready to do what you created them to do. Now we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, and everybody says in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, time to worship. Aaron. Wonderful. We'd all love if you'd stand and worship with us this morning. Rise up, O oh saints. Good morning. Amen. You may all be seated. We have so many wonderful things coming up at the Tabernacle, so check out the video and see what's coming up next.
We just passed Halloween. My church is one of those churches that does the trunk or treat harvest festival. <laughs> trunk or treat. It's fun, man. It's fine. It's just weird. You know? <laughs> Pastor gets up to him and said, All right, guys, we know we live in a different world now, okay? You can't be going door to door, knocking on doors, asking for candy. It's not safe. It's a different world now, man. What we're going to do, we're going to line up all the cars in the parking lot <laughs> in the dark decorate them, and we're going to teach kids that car trunks may be full of delicious candy. Amen. Beautiful singing, right? 
I just asked Jeff, who so faithfully plays on the piano every single Sunday, how long he's been playing the piano here, and he told me 28 years. Can we give it up for Jeff, who just does an amazing job? Incredible. So grateful for him. Come on, let's all stand together. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Come on, if you would bow your heads with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We're so excited to have you here today, and I'm extremely eager to hear the message from Tim, who's with us from another part of New Jersey. You're going to be blessed, as well as tonight for the event. Anybody planning on coming out tonight? It's going to be an incredible uh, event with Tony Campella and Mark, and I actually heard Mark when I was about 11 years old, and he was funny as can be and can sing, has an amazing voice, and I know you're going to be blessed tonight if you can make it out for that, but at this time, we're going to take our offering as the ushers get ready to come forward. And we just want to thank you for your generosity and your sacrifice in this place. And we're going to pray that God would bless this moment and bless this day. But before he does that, you know, I'm just reminded, I think it was Martin Luther who originally said, he said, I have held many things in my hand and I have lost them all. But whatever I've put in God's hand, I still possess. And this is just a chance for us just to put resources into God's hand. You're not giving to a church. You're not giving to an organization. We're giving to God right now so that he can do his work through his kingdom. And I don't know about you, the Bible says that those who have been treated generously should live generously. And I know from my own life, I don't deserve to be here. I haven't earned anything. Everything I have is from God. So I feel like I've been treated so generously. So that just makes it easy for me to give and to be generous. And we just want to thank you for your for your sacrifice and everybody that gives to help the tabernacle move forward here in Ocean City. So let's pray together, and then we're gonna continue on with singing in the service. Jesus, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you that before we were ever born, you knew that we would be right here in this service and in this season of life. And God, I just pray that this would be a moment that we just place what you have given us into your hands. God, we're really not even giving to you, we're returning to you what is already yours. So God, would you bless this offering, would you bless this moment, and be with us today. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. discouraged why should the shadows come why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on. And I know he watches over me. His eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Yeah. 
sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches over. Once again, we are blessed beyond what we could imagine. Well, before I tell you about today with Pastor Tim, I don't know if you noticed that the screen has changed. Um, Pastor Tim Delina cannot be with us next week. But guess who's going to preach? Pastor Todd Cruz. Pastor Todd, you know, I've told you, he spent 10 years in Brooklyn. He built one of the, the largest young adult nights. Friday nights, they'd have 1,000 people. Last fall, he transitioned, and he's on the pastoral team of Hillsong, New York. If you know much about Hillsong, they are an international, amazing, powerful ministry. But God sent him. He's been here since last February helping me a little. So next week. And I just want to tell you, Pastor Tim, who was going to come, was a mentor to Pastor Todd, also associate pastor at Brooklyn. But he just couldn't do it. But let's talk about the blessing God has sent us this week. The founder and the lead pastor of Liquid Church. It started, you know, we've heard this story before, and it just amazes me. It started in a, a little old basement of a church with Pastor Tim and 12 of his friends. He now has six campuses. This is God. Six campuses. Uh, he was with us, um, not last year, but the year before, if you remember. He's, he's preached to us twice. And, you know, the Lord always impresses upon me when, when you really remember the message, then you know there was something special from God. First year he preached here, he preached on heaven is for real. Many of you might remember there was a big door. And he talked about his own father's death and about heaven. Then the next time he came, he, it was, you married the wrong person. Well, he's been talking to me about his message for this week. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. You might 
you might feel a little more squeezed, but I want to tell you, it's a message for the times that we live in from the throne of God. Please welcome Pastor Tim Lucas. All right. Good morning, Ocean City. How are we doing, guys? Awesome. Good. This is a lively group, I was told. 10.30 is always asleep. 8.30 is always awake. I'm glad you're here. Hey, I always like to start with something funny. You guys like to laugh? Uh, I heard about this. You may have heard of uh, there was a middle-aged woman. She had a heart attack, went to the hospital. She cried out, God, is this it? And she felt like the Lord spoke directly to her and said, no, I'm giving you 40 more years. And so she actually said, well, if I'm going to have 40 more years, I want to look good. So she stayed in the hospital. Uh, she had a uh, liposuction, a uh, tummy tuck, a facelift. She gets out of the hospital as she's walking to her car, hit by a bus. She arrives in heaven and says, Lord, what happened? You said you were going to give me 40 more years. And the Lord said, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> just... uh, can you imagine if the Lord spoke to you directly, right? What would you ask? What would he say? Well, the Lord has done that. In fact, uh, Jesus has a direct download to you. He's written you a letter. It's in his word. It's the last book of the Bible. It's the book of Revelation. So if you have a, a Bible or if you have a phone that has a Bible on it, you can flip to the book of Revelation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the seven churches of Revelation. And um, this is written by the Apostle John. And uh, I was sharing with our congregation a little bit about the diff seven different churches today. I'm not going to go through all seven. Just focus on one. But they were surprised to learn that this letter from Jesus to his church. It was dictated to the Apostle John. And when John wrote down these words that you're about to read, he was in prison. He was actually on an island called Patmos. And it was a, it was a penal colony. He wasn't there on vacation. And while he's in uh, uh, Patmos, he has this vision of Jesus. But hold on. It's not the Jesus that you think of you know, the Jesus with a lamb on his shoulder, Jesus meek and mild and flowing Miss Breck hair. It's not that Jesus. This is Jesus as you and I will see him next. So we need to be aware of who that is. This is Jesus with flames of fire in his eyes, is what John says. Uh, a robe dipped in blood and a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So John kind of falls down almost dead. He can't... He's so overwhelmed. This is Jesus, the coming, conquering king, yeah? With the heat of a thousand nuclear reactors pouring off of him. He said, John, I want you to write down seven things. Seven letters to seven churches. That's what we have here. And these churches follow the Roman postal route in Asia Minor. Let me show you on a map up here. Take a look at this map. You can kind of see them. Uh, starting uh, there, uh, this is modern day Turkey, right? Starting with Ephesus, Smyrna, you can see them, Laodicea, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is where the real sinners are. <laughs> Eagles fans. <laughs> but this is modern day Turkey. Oh, we're going to have a good time today. And in his seven letters to these seven churches in seven cities, Jesus commends his people for doing some things right, really, really well, and then he condemns them. For where they're compromising on their faith. Well, today I want to open and read together Jesus' second letter to the church in Smyrna. And I think this letter is going to encourage you because it really addresses the question, where's God when it hurts? I think Christ's words to the Christians who are suffering in this city clearly speak to modern believers today. I mean, I don't know where, what area you may feel squeezed or hurting in. It may be a, a health situation. You've had an unseen diagnosis uh, that kind of has rocked your world. Or there's a family situation. Maybe a relationship breakdown in your life. Uh, or maybe just you're just feeling, you know, you watch the news. Does that freak you out? You may feel just general fear and anxiety from the moral chaos that we see in our culture. Let me give you a little background about Smyrna first, though. Smyrna is the modern-day city of Izmir, Turkey. You could actually go there today. That's what you would see. It's a city of skyscrapers on the Aegean coast. It had a seaport. It was very cosmopolitan. It was known for its architecture, its fine wine, and the beauty. You can see the, the sky. But this is the ancient agora where, when John is writing. Let me show you a picture of that. You can still visit it today. It's the ruins, the marketplace. And this was a sophisticated city. 
Smyrna was known for literature and the arts. And here's kind of a cool fact. The guy who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad was born here. Do you know, anyone know his name? Homer, yes. This is not Homer Simpson. This is Homer, uh, the po Greek poet, right? Smyrna was home to Homer. And so Jesus writes this letter to the Christ followers who are living here in Smyrna. Revelation 2. I'm going to start at verse 8. You can follow with me verse by verse. He says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last. Who what? Let's do this to, uh, this morning. Wherever you see words in bold, let's read it out loud together. Okay, ready? Who died and came to life again. So who's speaking? Jesus, right? This is the crucified and resurrected Christ writing. He who died and came to life. Jesus says, I'm the first. I was there at the beginning. I'm the creator of all creation. And I am the last. I will be there at the end. I am the author of all eternity. But there's a second meaning. There's a double meaning to this phrase, who died and came to life again. This is kind of cool. Smyrna, you may not know, it was destroyed in 600 B.C. It was burned to the ground. And they rebuilt it in 290 B.C. And because of that, Smyrna had a nickname. This was the city that died and came back to life. So this is Jesus kind of winking at his church, saying, I know about you guys. I went through that. I see what you're going through. And Jesus says in verse 9, I know your, what's that word, church? Afflictions and your poverty. Circle that word afflictions. I like to write in my Bible or you can circle on your phone, whatever. The Greek word for affliction actually means to crush or squeeze something between two plates. So in the ancient world, you would have pictured somebody, something like this. Now can you get a close up of this, Warren? Take a look at this thing. This is a juice press. Now, in the ancient world, they didn't do juice. This would have been an olive press. And you guys understand, you put the olives in, you squeeze it, and out comes the, the olive oil. Now, you know, here we are in New Jersey, so I was like, you know what? Let's do oranges. Today, we're going to have mimosas in church. Is that okay, Paula? We're going to do that? And when he says affliction, if you were in the Smyrna, you said, oh, I know what affliction is. Affliction is when you put something between two plates and you squeeze it. Ah! Oh! And out comes that delicious nectar. <laughs> Praise God. Little OJ right now. Hmm. Sweet for us. Very painful for the Christians in Smyrna. They were being afflicted. And over time, that word affliction came to have a double meaning. It meant somebody who's getting squeezed. Someone who's getting the life crushed out of them. And so when Jesus says, I know your afflictions, he's saying, Christians, I know you're getting crushed. Guys, this is the persecuted church. These are Christians who were suffering deeply for their faith in Jesus. Now, you might be like, well, why were they getting crushed, Tim? <laughs> the answer is very simple, because they refused to worship Caesar. See, the city of Smyrna had this fierce allegiance to Rome. In fact, when Rome came to power in that region... Uh, Smyrna jumped kind of on the Caesar train. They were the first city to erect uh, the temple to Roma, the goddess of Rome. And they it was designed for all the citizens to worship the Roman emperor. So understand Caesar was considered God. In fact, every year, the citizens of Smyrna had to come out and they were required to go to the temple of Rome. Where they would take a pinch of incense, walk forward to the altar, drop it in the fire, and go, Caesar is Lord. It was kind of the Heil Hitler of their day. And every citizen was required to do that, to be a citizen in good standing. But the Christians wouldn't do it. They refused to say Caesar is Lord. And so they said, no, no, no. When we go to church, when we go to temple, here's what we say. Jesus is Lord. Amen? That was our gospel. That was the good news. There's like, there's actually only one God. There's one ruler. There's one master worthy of worship. His name is Jesus. And where your God, Caesar, rules through power and intimidation and fear, our God, Jesus, rules through love, humility, and self-sacrifice. So the Christians refused to worship Caesar. And in Smyrna, let me tell you, that was fatal. In Smyrna, you didn't worship Caesar. You got crushed for that. You got squeezed. The emperor Domitian was a murderous thug. He came down hard on the Christian community. The believers in Smyrna lost everything. They lost their property. 
They lost their businesses, their homes, because worshiping Caesar was how you ensured the government's blessing. It, it was your patriotic duty as a Roman citizen. So when a Christian said, no, Caesar isn't Lord, Jesus is Lord, it was seen as treason. How dare you defy the empire? No one disrespects Caesar this way. And so Rome declared open season on Christians. They said, we are going to crush them. And they crushed them. Beating a Christian actually became legal. You could physically be a Christian. Some of them were thrown into prison with absolutely no cause. They crushed them. Many lost their lives. Scores of Christians in Smyrna were executed for their faith in Christ. In fact, check this out. Second century, the pastor of Smyrna was a guy named Polycarp. He was hauled to the middle of the city stadium where the Olympics were held. They tied Pastor Polycarp to a pole, called all the city in to watch, where they burned him alive. And when the flames didn't kill Pastor Polycarp immediately, they stabbed him to death while the people of the city watched and cheered. Suffice to say, the, the Christians are getting crushed, squeezed, pressed, poverty, hunger, fear, betrayal. On every side, they lost everything for their faith. And so Jesus writes, and he says, I know, I know your afflictions and your poverty. And yet you are, what's that word, church? Rich. How can he say that? We'll see in a minute. Keep reading. He says, I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Let me unpack that because on the surface, right, that could seem anti-Semitic, but it's not. See, Christianity has Jewish roots, right? Jesus was Jewish. John, who's writing, is Jewish. The early Christian movement at this point is mostly made up of Jewish converts at this point. But at this moment, Christianity is actually beginning to distinguish itself from Judaism and some in the Jewish synagogue saw it as a cult. They said Christianity is a cancer that we have to remove. And so they attacked it with slander. You guys know what slander is? Right? Character assassination. Yeah. Where you spread lies, rumors, fake news. How about that? <laughs> and it cost the Christians dearly. Christian businesses were boycotted. Kids were kicked out of school. Wherever there were trouble or riots in the city, Christians were first in line to blame. And so the synagogue leaders actually instigated terror against Jesus' followers, which is not Jewish, it's satanic. It's demonically motivated persecution. Which is why Jesus says, I know. I know your afflictions and your poverty. I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews but are not, but they're a synagogue of Satan. And he says, do not be afraid of what you are about to what? Suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer. What's that word, church? For 10 days. Now, it, let's be honest, right? Time out. It is hard for us to get our minds around persecution like this today, right? For believers living in the East Coast, the U.S., 2017, announcing you're a Christian, while not as popular as it may have been 50 years ago, it still comes with a generally low price tag. In America, we enjoy religious freedom, right? The majority of our population identifies as Christian. Now, that might be Catholic or Protestant, but there's skepticism, there's pushback in our culture, but there's not full-blown persecution yet. And as a Christian on the East Coast, you might be the butt of a joke at a party, but they're not going to take you to the top of the building and throw you off. You announce you're a Christian in Saudi Arabia, oh, Somalia, or Yemen, where it's illegal, in a militant Islamic culture, dire consequences. It can cost you your business, your reputation. It can cost you your life. Let me tell you, many parts of the world today, the price tag for following Jesus, extremely high, extremely high. But persecution can seem so far away from us, so I want to take just a minute to bring it a little bit closer this morning. Because even though we're here worshiping in obviously relative comfort, right now all over this world, on this Sunday morning, at this very moment, there are Christians, your brothers and sisters, getting crushed. In January, the human rights group Open Doors released their annual world watch list of the top 50 countries where it's hardest to be a Christian. And sadly, last year set a new record. 2016 is now officially the most violent year 
for persecution of Christians in modern history. Over 100 million Christians experienced persecution, which is just simply defined as hostility for identifying with the name of Christ. So we're talking about beatings, abductions, arrests, tortures, executions in over 60 countries around the globe. Christian martyrdoms and destruction of churches doubled two times as many on every continent last year. Open Doors called 2016 the year of fear. At the top of the list, North Korea. No surprise maybe to you. They remain the number one perpetrator they have for 14 years straight. Right now, today, as we worship here, there are 70,000 Christians in labor camps in North Korea. Their crime? I follow Jesus. They call on the name of Christ. One of them is Toronto pastor Hyun Soo Lim, who was sentenced to life in prison after making hundreds of humanitarian trips bringing food and medicine to the poor. And because of the global outcry, praise God, Lim was released last week. <laughs> after, yeah, praise God for that. After North Korea, the top ten include Iraq, where Christians are on the verge of extinction, as well as Syria, where the Christian church is in danger of being wiped out of existence by Islamic terror groups like ISIS. In addition to that death and destruction, Christi more Christians were displaced. That means they were forced to flee their homes and churches in record numbers last year. Here's a picture of Aleppo. Take a look at this. This is Syria's largest Christian city, and they saw the Christian population go from 400,000 down to 60,000. Well, more than one million refugees fled from the Middle East to Europe. So, friends, reality check. Understand the times we're living in. Global persecution of Christians is at its highest level in modern history. Every month, you can see on the screen, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. 214 churches are destroyed. And 772 forms of violence are committed against Christ followers. Beatings, kidnappings, rapes, arrests, forced marriages. That can be hard to absorb if you watch the nightly news, isn't it? The numbers to me sometimes get numbing. And we wonder sometimes, where's God in all of this? Well, today I want to humanize it for you by allowing you to listen to one voice. One Christian woman named Liana. Liana and her family are Christians living in Syria. And remarkably, this is incredible, they turned down offers of asylums, asylum here in the West after the Civil War broke out. They knew the cost of staying in Syria might cost their life, but they chose to stay so they could witness to their Muslim neighbors and encourage other Christians. Lean in, listen. This is Liana's story. We were praying for revival believing God would do a big work in Syria. Then the war came. Now the terrorists are attacking Christian homes, churches, and even our children. Their goal is to empty Syria of its Christians. We hate the spirit of Islam that is destroying our country, but we love our Muslim neighbors. They come to us and say, in the name of our God, terrorist rape and kill, where is God? We tell them about Jesus, and many are coming to know him. Still others say, we are like living in hell. One day, while I was praying, I asked God what he would have me do to be his witness. But he only asked me, will you give me your life? As I prayed, I understood he wanted all of me. And I said yes. If the time came, I was willing to die for Jesus. The next day, while I was praying, I asked God again what he would have me do. This time, he asked me, are you willing to give me your husband's life? It is not easy to be ready to die. My husband and I prayed about this together. We said yes to God. 
The terrorists know who we are and that we share Jesus with Muslims. It is not safe for our family. My husband and I prayed and fasted, and together we agreed. God gave us our precious children. He has the freedom to take them back. When we agreed to put our children on the altar, I knew I had to tell them the truth. I told them that we might see some blood and have some pain, but it would only be for a little while. <laughs> that we should just close our eyes. And when we open them, we will be with Jesus. Am I a good mother? Do you have to tell my children such things? I also told them that as long as God wants us to be safe, we will be safe, that He is in control. Even during the bloodshed, during the killing, He is carrying our future. This is what it means to be a Christian in Syria. Sobering stuff. As you just heard, Leanna's prayer is that you and I would remember our brothers and sisters around the world and pray for them. According to Open Doors, more than our money, more than our sympathy, the most common request of persecuted believers is pray for us. That Christians in the West would stop and pray regularly for our brothers and sisters who suffer for their faith in Christ. And so I just want to do that right now. Would you just bow your head real quickly? Father, I'm praying right now for Liana and your church, Lord, in Syria, in the Middle East, Father God. Would you fill them right now with the Holy Spirit? Protect them by the power of your word. Father God, we ask for the blood of Jesus to be over them and their families. God, I pray right now for believers in China who are huddled in basements and underground caves, maybe around a single page of Scripture, and they're singing, and they have none of our audio-visual equipment, but, Father, they are lifting up the name of Jesus. May their music be sweet to your ears, Father God, and may you come quickly to their aid. Father, we unite in heart and mind right now with our brothers and sisters. We're one family in Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everyone said. You know, praying for persecuted Christians is our responsibility as global Christians. I know that's the heart of this house, that we would be a global community. So let me encourage you to visit opendoorsusa.org. Uh, it has resources. You can pray daily for the persecuted Christians in the top 50 countries. But you know, it's not just in the Middle East. There's increasingly fierce persecution in, in parts of Asia. India ranked in the top 20 for the first time. Uh, a lot of extremists there are being emboldened by the Modi government. And more and more ethnic nationalism is, oh, is really fueling open-air persecution against Christian believers. Last year in Pakistan, for instance, a suicide bomber killed more than 70 Christians on Easter Sunday as they celebrated the resurrection at a local park. In Africa, missionaries were killed, seven of them, by terrorists in Burkina Faso. So guys, the Bible says, commands us. It actually says this in 1 Peter. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the what? Say it together. Family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So this is a way for us to, to recognize we're part of the global family of God and really take responsibility for supporting our brothers and sisters around the world. Because persecution, being crushed for your faith, while not necessarily a daily part of our world, it's a daily reality for much of the world, which makes Jesus' words here to believers in Smyrna, all the more powerful. Remember, that word affliction means to be squeezed or pressed or getting the life crushed out of you from every side. You know what? You don't have to live in a war zone to feel the pressure, do you? <laughs> Let's make this personal. Here's what I want to do. I want to take the global and now bring it down to the personal. Because I believe there's a lot of people in this room right now who are feeling the pressure. You are under daily pressure, feeling squeezed and wondering, where's God in all this? In fact, I know there's probably some of you 
in this room and you've been looking at the imagery of this, of this orange and you're like, Tim, that's me. I'm the orange. That's me. <laughs> I'm run, wrung out. It's not on the scale of maybe global persecution, but on a personal level, we're just getting the life squeezed out of us a little bit. In, in my church, um, here's who it is. It's the husband and wife who are lying in their bed at night and it's three o'clock in the morning and they do not know where their 17-year-old daughter is at because she's defiant. And she has drifted far from God and she's drifted far from them and they're laying awake in their bed at night just waiting to hear the door open and they don't know if she's going to walk in sober or not. And something is crushing their heart about that situation. I know if I took a financial survey of this room, there are some of you who would say, you know what? I'm blessed right now. Praise God. We're, we're stable. We're doing well. We're living in a season of surplus. But some of you would say, Tim, I'm getting killed. That, that, after the job loss, if I look at where our financial world was two or three years ago and where we are after the health crisis now, I'm getting crushed. Talk about the pressure. I'm the orange. I know there are some of you who you are burdened by medical issues. Maybe you received a crushing diagnosis and you've prayed for healing or the surgery hasn't come yet. And some of those health issues are going to get resolved while others won't go away. It's chronic and it's crushing. Guys, that is legitimate affliction too. Don't minimize the pain that people carry day to day. Don't say, well, it's not like I'm living in Syria. Compared to them, I've got first world problems. Be kind. Show mercy to yourself. The church is the global family of God, and you are his precious child that he cares about as a father. And your father in heaven, he sees your struggle, your afflictions, your poverty, and this letter is written to you too. Look at the letter in your hands. This is from your father. What are you facing that seems maybe to be more than you can take? Is it relationship uh, pressures? Is it a health issue? At times like these, it's wonderful, natural to say, where's God when it hurts? But Jesus, he wrote this letter to a suffering church to let us know, I am never closer to my children than when they suffer. Christ is with you, and he can help you. In Hebrews 2, we're told this, since he, that is Jesus, has gone through what? Gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being what? Tested. Do you remember how Jesus starts the letter? He says, this is from he who died and came to life. In other words, he says, do you remember my story? I was crushed on the cross for your sin, and I came back. So I know what it means to suffer. I know what pain and poverty is like. Jesus was ridiculed, unjustly accused, tortured, executed on a Roman cross. But he says, I came to life again by the power of God. And so will you if you trust in me. Amen? Don't forget the larger story of God that you are a part of, church. See, as Christians, we have two parts of our story, right? There's the crucifixion part, the crushing of God's only son. Arrested tortured, beaten, martyred by an angry mob. But then there's the resurrection story, the truth that even death couldn't hold Jesus. He was raised to life by the power of God and holds the power of hell, the keys to hell in his hands. He says, the same will happen to every person who believes on my name. So to Christians getting crushed, Jesus speaks this beautiful, this, this sweet word of comfort and hope. He says, whatever you're going through, I have been there. I drank the cup. And the Bible promises I am able to help you when you are being tested. So no matter what life is crushing out of you right now, Jesus is speaking a word to you and he is actually saying to you today, I think with the fire and intensity and passion in his eyes, he is saying to you, he's saying, I am with you. Can you say that, church? I am with you. Turn to your neighbor, look him in the eyes and say, I am with you. I'm with you. Somebody needs to hear that. Someone needs to hear. I came today because I'm like, I was telling Paul, I'm like, somebody needed to hear this word to them from Jesus. In the midst of all your medical tests and your doctor's visits, I am with you. Amen? As you care for elderly parents, uh, you know, who are aging more and more and you're raising young kids and you're squeezed on both sides, Jesus is saying, I'm with you. I see the number of job interviews that you've been on, the resumes you sent out. I know you're discouraged, but I am with you. I know the trouble you're having. 
with your kids, your older son or daughter, but it's just a short season and I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. I'm the one who died, came to life, and so will you if you trust in me. Look what he says to the Christians in Smyrna. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are, what's that word? Rich. What? (laughs) What's he talking about? They lost everything. How can these guys be rich? Now, obviously, he's not talking about material wealth, but spiritual wealth. Even though the Christians of Smyrna were getting crushed, they were rich in faith. What does that mean to be rich in faith? It means a lot of things. But I think it means that Christ gives you the ability to actually experience joy even when you're suffering. You actually don't let the roots of bitterness sink down into your heart, but your joy stays intact. Rich in faith means you have the ability to experience a sense of God's goodness even in the middle of grief. Even when you're grieving. Even when the healing hasn't come yet or there's pain or loss and you grieve, you still trust that the Father is good. It means even when you go through a season of scarcity, you know, it's hand to mouth, you don't have enough, you have this sense of contentment inside. Jesus says, I'm, you're rich, I'm with you, I'm with you, and if my presence is with you, you have everything you need. See, because of Christ, guys, we can be at our best even when life is at its worst. I, I want to say that again, because again, somebody needs to hear this today. You can be at your best even when life is at its worst, even in the season of of crushing, of pressure, where you don't know if you can take another minute. How's that possible? How do you do that? Get practical, Tim. Look at verse 10. Jesus gives us an answer. He tells the Christians in Smyrna, do two things. Here's what you do when you're getting crushed. What does Jesus say? First thing, I want to read these four words out loud together. Verse 10, Jesus says, do not, go ahead there, uh, Warren, do not be what? Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Now, I wish it said, don't be afraid because you're not going to suffer. That's if I wrote the Bible, okay? (laughs) Right? Phew, what a relief. But it's not what it says. Jesus says, you know what? You're going to go through something intense. It's real. It's going to hurt. But don't be afraid. Don't live in fear. Fear is very paralyzing, isn't it? And that worry, that anxiety can be more debilitating than the situation if you allow it. Now, look, I know it's not easy, but listen to what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for how long? Ten days. In other words, a week and a half. Translation, all suffering is temporary. It is not forever. In contrast to eternity, the life that God has given you through Christ, the season of suffering that you go through is relatively short. There is a fixed point. There's a beginning. There's an end compared to what's eternal and everlasting. So notice something. Your God doesn't deny the pain. He acknowledges this is going to be really, really hard, but it won't last forever. Ten days. Not literally ten days. Revelation is symbolic. And Revelation, ten days, is symbolic of a short period of time. So if you're getting crushed, Jesus says you need to do two things. First, don't be afraid. And secondly, I want to say this together, very powerful. Be what? Be faithful even to the point of death. And I'll give you life as your victor's crown. How are we supposed to respond when we suffer as Christians? First, Jesus says, no fear. And second, be faithful. Can you work with that? Can you work with that? When, when, you're, when you're getting crushed, don't be afraid. Instead, be faithful because suffering plays a role in your discipleship. This is part of the way that God actually forges our character. He never sends the suffering. Your father is not a martyr. But he says, I will use even this for your good and my glory if you trust me. You know what that means? It means even in the middle of the thing that's crushing you, the the divorce you didn't want, the diagnosis you didn't see coming, the foreclosure, the family drama, God is doing something potentially deep in your heart. Parents, listen to this. He may be doing something in the lives of your children as they watch your faithfulness, as they see you trust God and refuse to to slander your ex (laughs) or those who hurt you, Instead, you speak graciously and trust your father with the outcome. You don't turn bitter and walk away and lose faith. Don't get discouraged. The apostle Paul says this, for our, what, light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I get that this doesn't seem light and momentary in the moment. 
But you got to remember, Christian, the larger story of God that he's writing in your life. The first part may be crucifixion like your Savior. But his story ends with what? Resurrection. Jesus says, follow me. You can trust me. I know. I've been there. I was crushed on the cross for you, and I will use this for your good. I will work this for God's glory if you trust me. What's the glory you're saying? What's the glory? Did you look at the last verse? Come on, guys, last verse. Jesus promises a special reward for those who stay faithful to the end. Here's what he says. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I'll give you life as your what? Victor's crown. Little known fact. Every five years, Smyrna hosted the Olympics. Did you know that? They hosted the Olympic Games in their stadium where they crucified that pastor. And whenever runners ran a race or an event in the Olympics, you kind of know what they might have received. If you won the 100-yard dash, you received what? A victor's crown. Typically a laurel wreath like the one Michael Phelps wore at the Athens Olympics in 2014. When the Olympics started, they didn't give gold medals. You got a victor's crown made of olive and bay leaves. And if you overcame the trial, if you achieved the victory, you got a crown. So Michael Phelps got a medal around his neck, and he got a crown on his head. Pretty sweet, yeah? Again, Jesus is so personal, isn't he? He uses an Olympic image for an Olympic town. And he says to his followers in Smyrna, I have a special honor for those of you who have been faithful who have overcome, who have pushed through the fear, and you kept the faith, I'm going to give you the crown of life, which is heaven. The promise of heaven, eternal glory. See, Jesus not only gives us strength for this life now, but when it's over, he says, I am giving you eternal life, salvation in the life to come, amen? Where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more mourning, no more death, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things is gone. It's passed away, and I'm making everything what? New. You remember Leanna and her husband? They said, we'll stay in Syria because we're ready to die for Christ. And I watched that, and I I thought, I don't know that I could say that. How could she say that? Because Leanna understood. Eternal life is her eternal reward. What is Jesus saying to you right now? In this season of suffering... He's saying, don't forget, eternal life is your eternal reward. This is what I promised. This is what I died to give you, and it can never be taken. He ends by saying, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who's victorious will not be heard at all by the second death. And then the letter closes. The Bible says, that every single person is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. In other words, every single person in this room, including me, we don't get to choose how or when, but if you trust in Christ, at the end of this life, it's just the beginning of life with him forever. When you push past your fear and you put your faith in Christ, he says the day will come when I will welcome you home. And guess what? You're going to stand on the podium. Here's the scene in heaven. You're going to stand at the podium, and instead of judgment, the second death, a lake of fire, you're going to bow your head, and Jesus is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome into the joy of the Lord. I give you the crown of life. Smyrna is one of the only churches in Revelation who receives no correction from Jesus. Just encouragement. Comfort which shows your Savior's very personal, very tender care for you, for his children who are being crushed. He's saying, don't be afraid. Don't be squeezed. Be faithful. Have no fear. I will meet you at the finish line. I have a great reward waiting for you. Are you hurting today? Maybe you weren't going to come to church today because you're going through a trial. You're going through something very, very difficult, and you feel squeezed or you feel oppressed. And you wonder, you know what, where's God in this? And today I believe God is saying, you know what, here's your answer. My son Jesus is right here, right now. And he can help you. Today he promises you four words. I am with you. Would you lead us, sir, say it one more time. I am with you. He is with you. 
And if you trust him, he will carry you home, church. Amen? I want to pray together. Let's stand up. Grab the hand of your neighbor. Go ahead. Grab the hand of your neighbor. We're going to pray together. Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking. Father God, thank you that you are a loving Father with outrageous compassion. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that it was his crushing on a cross that gives us hope. And Father God, I pray right now as we hold hands, Father, we're joining the global church right now around the world. Believers in Syria, I'm thinking of Liana and her family, Chinese believers in a basement. We are joining hearts and hands right now. And we're saying, Jesus, we trust you. We believe you are with us and that you will never forsake us to the very end. And so, Father, I ask for a special anointing and filling with the Holy Spirit. Give strength to those who are suffering. Just pour right now your supernatural patience, God, into those of us who are waiting for a breakthrough. And, Father God, let the peace of the Holy Spirit settle on our hearts right now so we know deep in our core, I am with you. We love you, Father. We praise you. We give glory to you. In the name of Jesus, everyone said together, amen. Great to be with you, church. Be encouraged today. Amen. Amen. Let's stay standing. One more time. Can we thank Pastor Tim for being with us today and that profound teaching? Thank you. Our worship team is going to come up here and just lead us in a song. They're going to sing How Great Thou Art. I think what an appropriate song and tied into the message. Just this idea of even when life does not feel great, how many believe that God is still great? And sometimes when your circumstances, your season, your struggle doesn't match your expectation of what you thought it would be, that is when you have to trust in the character of God the most. And I just love this demonstration. I don't know, I don't know about you, but that imagery is just going to stick with me. And I, I really believe sometimes the greater the breaking in our life, the greater the blessing in our life. So let's realize there's purpose in the things that we're going through, whether it's family stress, whether it's financial stress, whether it's health stress, God is doing this thing to produce a character and produce a hope that is in us. I walk away from this message just having hope that God is so much bigger than my season, that God is so much bigger than what it is that I'm going through. So let me just say a closing prayer. We're going to sing this as a as a declaration today that our God is great, even in the midst of our season that might be tough. So Jesus, we thank you for this message that was not from a man but from heaven, a supernatural reminder to say whatever season of suffering we are going through, God, you are sovereign. Your hand is upon us. You are working out great things, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. So God, I pray that our eyes would just be fixed upon you, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we would look to you and receive hope today for whatever it is that we're going through. So we thank you and we declare today your greatness. No matter what we are going through, no matter what we are facing, no matter what things look like, God, you are good and you do good. We pray this and believe this together in faith and in unity. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, let's sing this together.
scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul then sings my soul my savior god to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful week. We hope to see you back next week, but if not, enjoy your vacation. Have a good one.